Hello, and uh, the first thing I'm going to do is a check on the sound to make sure that everybody can hear me well. Uh, Lisa, if you are hearing this, could you just confirm that you can hear me okay? All right, everybody, um, we're going to be talking about oxytocin today, which is a really amazing hormone, a hormone of love, bonding, and connection. I'm wondering how many of you here have heard of that hormone before, and if you have, what have you heard? Yes, I can hear you. Yay, we are on. Good, awesome. So how many of you have, have heard of oxytocin before? And if you've heard, hello, Robin. Uh, I think I've seen Robin Keith here before. So tell us, before you tell us about oxytocin, let's l wait a little bit to build up the audience. Hi, Alex. Hello, Wendy. Dana, uh, Dana says she has heard of it. Great. Uh, the question is, do we have enough of it and how do we get more of it into our lives? And I'll tell you how amazing of a hormone it is. Um, yeah, so tell me where are you logging in from? That's always something that I always love to hear. Where are you from? Where are you coming? Where are you logging in from? So the reason why I want to talk about oxytocin today is because it is one of those hormones that is highly underestimated. It's actually a hormone and a neurotransmitter at the same time, and I'll tell you about the chemistry behind it in just a second. But just for now, let's just say it is, um, hi Christina from Montreal, uh, it is a hormone that helps us really love and bond and connect. And, and I think as much as intellectually a lot of us know about it, there isn't a lot of conversations I feel that are out there about what can we do to really cultivate it, bring it up higher, and we can do that just by various stimulations, and I'll tell you about it in a second, um, in order to really mitigate a lot of things in our lives, including stress. So, you know, um, the reason why I kind of uh, got to appreciate it again is because, um, you know, I, I went through quite a bit of stress just uh, two weeks ago, I was finishing up my manuscript. If you've been following me for a while, you know, I've submitted my book, I did it on time, and it's half health book, half cookbook, so a lot of work went into that. And, you know, and I have to say that, this, this, just the notion of writing a book and yet running your own business, it really took away a lot for me, and I could feel my adrenals getting really pooped out. And so have you guys experienced the kind of thing before where you, when your cortisol is running high for a long time, then what happens is, and you're not really making enough time for yourself to decompress during that period, it just builds up, builds up, builds up. You, one of the things that you find is like the sense of disconnection from other people. Has anybody experienced it here? And when I say disconnection, it's like, you know, you get text messages from people and they go like, are you okay? Like, do you want to, you know, let's go for a glass of wine. Let's meet up for lunch and people. And, and, and then you go like, and, and you just, I'm like, I just don't feel like responding to that right now. Right. Um, you know, I get invites to go for, to go for lunch or join a girl's group and I just don't go. Right. And then my team messages me and they're so sweet and supportive. And I'm like, eh, right? Just like the minimal response just to get through it. Who here has had that kind of experience when you felt that when your stress levels are high, then your sense of social disconnection from others, but also the sense of caring, the sense of love, the sense of just really the, the need for bonding with someone else is really not there. I mean, obviously the, the most extreme version of that would be postpartum depression, right? When a woman is has... It has such low levels of oxytocin, which has been suppressed by various factors, that she's not she's unable to bond with her child. So I'm wondering, has anybody one has anyone in here experienced that kind of thing before? So you know, I I've been doing this work long enough to know that okay, it's time to press the brake, and once the book is done, uh, I'm gonna take a week off, and I did. I went to some beautiful hot springs in Mount Colorado. I did like a little hot spring tour. I just went to two, but so I didn't want to move around for too much. And you know, the first hot spring I got to, uh, they say, well, actually there is no internet in your room. I, I just, I had like this anxiety attack, right? Cause you know, uh, today internet is like oxygen for us. 
And I thought, I cannot function without it. There's all these programs I want to watch online. And, you know, how can I be living without internet for the next five days here in this place? And I have to say, it was the biggest blessing ever because that really allowed me to totally disconnect uh, from, there was internet in the lobby, but then, so I will go to the lodge, I do my thing that I need to do. And then I say, I love Colorado. I know, me too. <laughs> That's why I decided to stay here. Um, even though I came here just to finish the book temporarily, uh, living, but then I decided this is gonna be my home. So thanks for saying that. Yeah, so, you know, and, and, and this is when, um, one thing that I've realized is that when you get into a hot spring, right, that was that moment of, what's the thing that people always say or do when they get into a hot spring, right? Or, or, or like, you know, the, the, the hot baths and stuff like that, right? I'm sure you notice that either they say it aloud or on the inside, they'll go, oh, right? <laughs> And when I was realizing it, I would do the hot bath, the hot, the hot springs like three, four times a day, three times a day typically, right? I'll go for a hike, I, you know, I do like uh, outdoorsy stuff. And um, hey there, uh, Robin is saying, yes, I felt that before when I had adrenal fatigue. Yeah, Robin, yeah, that's, we're talking about the disconnect that happens. And so the minute you get into that warm water, there's just that sense of, ah, oh, right? And guess what? That incredible sense of pleasure that you're experiencing is part, part of it is due to that hormone and neurotransmitter at the same time called oxytocin. And so you know how part of the reason why I chose to do these calls on Fridays is because I really want to encourage you and, and, and inspire you to take out time for yourself this weekend. Oh, wait, I keep talking about it, right? You do something for yourself. Hi there, Sandra from uh, Ohio, Akron. Um, so that's part of the reason why I'm doing it on Fridays, because then you can really start thinking about the weekend and, and do something for the weekend. Because Friday we tend to kind of, um, you know, uh, uh, yeah, and uh, to kind of start slowing down, right? So let's talk about oxytocin and what are some of the other things you can do to really bring up your levels of oxytocin. And by the way, if you have somebody in your life who's massively stressed out or somebody who's going through some adversity and they're struggling and they are disconnected, they are having all the adrenal fatigue symptoms, um, why don't you tag them in this post here as you're watching this right now so they can either come back later to watch it or they can join us live if they do it quickly enough. So let me tell you a couple of things about oxytocin because it's such a, uh, and for those of you who are joining late, I'm talking about a hormone and a neurotransmitter uh, called oxytocin. And that is a, a, a very powerful hormone of love, bonding, and, um, and connection with other people. So oxytocin is a peptide hormone. So it's not a steroid hormone. It's a peptide hormone. It's a different chemical uh, composition that's produced originally by the hypothalamus. But it's, uh, and then it's excreted by the pituitary gland. It's right at the bottom of your brain, deep, deep inside. And so what is, um, you know, what, the, 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 what we know oxytocin has been, the way it's been studied a lot is in childbirth and in, in during uh, times of sex and orgasm, right? So interestingly, oxytocin, actually, if you talk about the birthing part first, the, you know, the reproductive part first, you know, interestingly, oxytocin is actually the hormone that causes uterine contractions, first and foremost, and then after the birth, for the uterus to shrink, oxytocin is responsible for that, right? So, um, so interestingly, let's see, oh, this is, uh, I have one friend here who's just joined, Isabel, who's a very uh, good friend of my sister's and my friend from all the way from my childhood days in Malaysia. So hi there, Isabel. <laughs> um, yeah, and so interestingly, and then when the child is suckling on the breast of the mother, this is where, again, a huge dose of oxytocin is released, right? Creating that bond and connection between the mom and the baby. Um, and guess what? Oxytocin is also so important in releasing prolactin. And prolactin is like the word implies prolactin, lactation. It stimulates lactation. And so really the release of the milk only happens when there is a release of oxytocin. Now, isn't that fascinating that if a woman is stressed out, and we're going to talk about this in a second, how cortisol and oxytocin are like this, right? 
when <laughs> um, when oxytocin is is high, cortisol is gonna be low. When you are super stressed out, cortisol is high, oxytocin is gonna be low. So a stressed out mother, I'm sure you guys heard of this before. When a stressed out mom, hi there, Sandra and Michelle, welcome. Um, when when a mom is stressed out, she cannot breastfeed, right? The milk just isn't coming, and the more she's thinking about it that she's a bad mom, the the more um, of it inhibits that, and so that's the cortisol oxytocin play that uh, the opposite uh, parts that really play in here. Um, but also, you know, interestingly, um, oxytocin is also produced when we are having sex. And, and by the way, it's not just sex, it's also about cuddling as well. We'll talk about this in a second. One of the studies I had found, which is really fascinating, is that, hi there, Isabel. Uh, one of the studies that I had found that's absolutely fascinating is that as women, when we are having sex with a pet or another woman, it doesn't matter, um, we produce actually more oxytocin than a man does. And that's part of the reason why scientists explain why is it that casual sex for women, it's much more casual, much less casual, because we form these bonds and connections and expectations to that partner than the, than the man. For a guy, it's like, it could be a one night stand, it could be a casual thing, a drunk night, you know, and after that, they're like, nothing happened, maybe they talk about it, maybe they don't. And for a lot of women who say that it is just, a, uh, it's just nothing, um, a lot of times that is not true, even though they want to say that because it's the cool, hip thing to say that I'm like this independent woman and I can do what I want. And sure, you can do what you want, but I'm, what I'm saying is that in casual sex, just remember that we create much more of a bonding and connection with our partners than men do. And that's the reason why a lot of times women get much more um, attached to these casual encounters than men do. And when these things break up and the guy doesn't want to follow up and, and be in touch anymore, then women take it much harder than men do. So I thought it was a really interesting study on that. And that was an aha moment for me. I remember reading about it a few years ago um, that, you know, why is it that I have a lot of girlfriends who had that one night stand, that fling thing, and they were still not over it, uh, you know, a few months later where the guy is like, he's married now, you know, kind of a thing. So, um, and then the other thing that I had found, which I want to share with you is that uh, from the Life Science magazine, it says that men who have higher levels of oxytocin are much more faithful to their partners, which I thought was really fascinating. Um, and, um, and so what it basically means is that, you know, uh, so how do you raise up the oxytocin levels for yourself or your partner, right? And so having sex, that's why I think having, having an active sexual relationship with your partner is really important is to keep that oxytocin going. But also, you know, it's also the connection that's beyond sex, right? Because sex can also be very mechanical. It's really about just the bonding itself, the cuddling, for example, cuddling a child, cuddling a partner, cuddling an animal, a pet, all of those activities can help us release oxytocin beautifully. I think that is just such a wonderful thing. Uh, just to just to realize, you know, that we don't have to pop a pill. We don't we don't need to do an oxytocin spray, which it does exist. Um, you know, all we need to do is just really get out there and find something to cuddle <laughs> if you don't have one. And if you don't cuddle with your partner, start cuddling because that creates a much for, stronger bond. And so this study particularly showed they they were testing out men who had higher levels of oxytocin, and they exposed them to really really sexy single women. And they had found that men who had higher levels of oxytocin were much closer to their partners and were far less attracted to those sexy single women um, than men who had low oxytocin levels who were in partnerships. They found them not only physically being closer to those supermodels, <laughs> but they were also um, less committed to their partner. So really interesting study in that way. So go and get cuddle today. Get cuddling today uh, to keep your men. <laughs> so another thing that I had found while researching this is oxytocin appears to play a role in protecting intestines from damage and potential use and treatment of IBS, which is irritable bowel syndrome. And you know, one of the things when I used to coach, I used to do a lot of is something called a health uh, history or a health timeline, sorry. The high, ha, health timeline was a timeline to start writing down from the time of inception, from the time you were, you were, you know, uh, created, right? Um, the quality of your mother's 
um, pregnancy to the time you were born and the things that happened to you. And the interesting thing that comes out of this exercise, which by the way, you can end up doing, I did mine for about three weeks because I kept having things coming up back in the, up for me, is that what I had found is that whenever there was something traumatic that happened, two, three months later, I'll have some kind of ailment. You know, I remember when I lost my job, for example, I, I started having breast lumps around my boobs really quite quickly. I've got another friend who's just joined. Hello, Anton. So <clears throat> it's, that's a, I, I found it so fascinating that, you know, just at times of stress, we can have such a big impact on our, our intestines. And so, and, and so, you know, everybody in everyone disease manifests in a different way. One person is stressed out and three months later, they end up having with bre end up with breast, lamp, breast, lamp, breast lumps the way I did. Right. But there's other people who develop autoimmune diseases, probably in combination with other things and poor diet and lots of coffee and no sleep and all of that. Right. But anyway, so one of the things that is just really good to remember that in your toolbox of just well-being and you are rebalancing your hormones, you know, I talk a lot about nutrition already, you already know, getting off gluten, getting off sugar, getting off dairy, right, minimizing coffee, getting your sleep. But there's an element of just like of something like a cuddle and love and just being intimate with a person, whether it's a partner, whether it's a friend. And, you know, <clears throat> I don't know about you guys, but... Do you have that feeling um, that when you are with like close girlfriends, like there is a really feel good factor? And I haven't found any studies that shows is oxytocin. Um, hi there, Linda. She says, Arizona appreciates you. Thank you. Um, oh my gosh, Rachel is saying stomach issues here. I hug my poodle and it helps. Great information. Thank you. There we go. So, you know, it's nothing unusual. Um, and I mean, stress is just one of those incredible killers. It really is of, of so many things that, um, you know, I remember working with a woman who was ill every time on a Friday and no, sorry, it was not, it wasn't a Friday. It was midweek summer, Wednesday. <clears throat> and turned out, and I mean, we tried everything and you name it. And she was highly compliant, mind you. Sleep, detoxification, she got on the right diet. Her digestion was pretty good. You know, she did. She got off sugar, we cleared her candida, like the whole shebang. If you follow me for a while, you know what I'm talking about. And, and, and she was still so, so sick. And what we had discovered, and I wish there was me who pointed it out, but it wasn't, it was her husband who pointed it out to her. And he said to her, you know, you get sick every Wednesday and it's the day before your work. And so she was working Thursday, Friday, Saturday for a nonprofit, which was very badly run. And she was very, she, she, she was just a very toxic environment. So she really wasn't thriving there. In fact, it was opposite. It was killing her. And just that day before even thinking about the job, going into the job was manifesting in form of her autoimmunity. And she had a raging case of Hashimoto's. So this is, this is just so, so uh, important. Alex is saying, which is very true. Thank you, Alex. I have the feeling, I have a good feeling when in nature and by the sea. That's a great observation. Thank you. On my Thrivers group, which is a private group for people who have done my programs, in a hormone Thrivers group, I posted a video that was talking about scientists in Japan finding when you go through a forest, right, and you hug a tree and you're just in nature, there is scientific research now showing how much better that makes you feel. I won't be surprised if there's a connection to oxytocin. I'm not saying there is because I haven't seen any studies on it, but it's just yet another you know, thing that just makes you feel better. Whether oxytocin or not, it doesn't really matter. So I want to talk about um, you know, oxytocin and cortisol. Remember that, that, that you can either look at it this way, right? So it's like, is that seesaw effect when cortisol is high, oxytocin is low, and then it goes the other way when cortisol is low, oxytocin goes up. So our job as the guardian of our own, our own bodies, as the goddesses of our own bodies that govern what happens to it, what gets put in and what, who we surround ourselves with and what we do with our lives is to do as much as we can in bringing up oxytocin. When you're stressed out, when I was talking about the beginning of the call, last week was a tough week for me. Actually, the week before that was a tough the week before I left for my holiday was a tough week, right? And I felt very disconnected from everything and everybody. I was just like, just get it done, get out of here. I need my rest, you know, and I could feel my oxytocin was on its all time low. I was so disconnected with it from everybody. Being in nature, being in hot springs, being disconnected from the internet, not doing any work, 
Um, talking to a couple of friends I really I haven't talked to for a long time and it feels very nurturing to talk to them. Um, it just, just brought up back that oxytocin. So, you know, what I want to encourage you to do is, um, actually, let me just show you like a little demo because I've, where's my water? Oh, it's right here. Okay. Imagine, this is a glass of water I'm sipping on, right? So imagine this is your, this is your stress, right? Stress levels. Now, imagine if this is, there was a faucet out here. When you open it up, it just releases the water and the water drips out, right? Now, stress is basically pouring the water into this bucket here. And you keep pouring it in, keep pouring it in, keep pouring it in, right? Until when it overflows, you're like me, right? Disconnected and worst case can happen with a lot of other stuff with adrenal fatigue, as you know. Now, imagine if this faucet here is letting that stress out, minimizing that stress, right? You open that faucet and you're letting the water run out. Even if your stress is still coming in here, when you have that faucet and you open it up, that's, that's, you know, that basically starts dripping out and you've, you're finding yourself in much better balance. So that means that even though you're going through a stressful time, make sure you go and get a massage. Make sure you get a cuddle. Make sure you get a pet, a cat or dog or whatever if you can tolerate them. You don't allergies, right? Don't get pets when you have allergies. That's not going to serve you well. Your immune system is going to tank. So, you know, it's just to bring up that oxytocin over and over again, which is going to open up that faucet in that glass that I showed just now that will just help you to regulate everything um, so much more beautifully. So, you know, um, and, and it's true that oxytocin and cortisol are in a hate, love and hate relationship, unfortunately, and, and they oppose each other. So, but the good news is that when you do something for yourself, when you're bringing up your oxytocin with a hug, with orgasm, if you don't have a partner, you don't have anybody to hug, Orgasms are perfectly fine too, right? Um, having an orgasm, hugging something, going to the, going to, doing something that makes you feel happy, it automatically suppresses your cortisol levels as well, even though you're stressed out. And that's one of the beautiful things about oxytocin. So uh, let's see. And what else do I want to talk about? The other thing I found out, and I want to just share with you, this is not my spectrum of area by any means. But I found it, so I thought I'll share this with you. There are studies that show that oxytocin also helps people, oxytocin treatments, they call it, so it's actually in a spray form, will help children or actually people with autism to feel more connected to other people, to understand other people's emotions. I thought that was kind of fascinating as well, on the impact of that. Um, April is saying, I've been a big mess. I had my third C-section and tubes tight and suffer chronic pain from surgery and hormones, um, been suffering from tubal. I never, I never feel well. Yeah. Um, April. Yeah. So that, that's a lot to go through. And you can just imagine that through those, through those kind of procedures and operations, how much pain and cortisol release and adrenal fatigue your body's going through. So April, may, let me ask you this. What can you do this weekend to bring in something that gives you joy and and release? I'm curious to know if you could if you could share this with us. Um, Alex is saying I do two to three days without a Wi-Fi at home to, uh, now. Yeah, that's a that's a great idea. I love that. So share with me what are the things that are coming mind, into mind for you over the next few days. Uh, well, over the weekend, which is tomorrow and Sunday, what are you going to be doing to raise your oxytocin levels based on what I've been talking about here? And while you guys are doing this, I want to tell you about something else. You know, I'm a kind of a restless person, right? And I'm a huge creator. So I love to create. Um, and uh, Sandra is saying she's going to be exploring with my DSLR, which is basically a camera. Kelly Leong is another, she's another colleague of mine. We used to work together in Hong Kong. Hello, Kelly. Um, so I want to, um, before, so while I'm waiting for you guys to say, what are you, what are the things you're going to be doing to de-stress this weekend, to raise your oxytocin levels? Um, I just want to share with you my next project that I'm working on. And I have a question for you, and I would love for you to, to share more on this. So... You know, I, um, I'm i done with the book, right? And the the thing that kept coming up for me a lot of times is that, 
You know, our chemical load uh, that really impacts our hormones, it's not just coming from food, right, that we can help rebalance, but it also is coming from a lot of external factors, such as skincare products, the shampoos we are using, the, uh, you know, the fr air fresheners we are burning at home, right, uh, the cooking equipment that we're using to, um, and, and so eliminating all these toxins with healthy options, but also, and I realized, you know, um, there are so many, I've, I've had a lot of interest in essential oils and, and herbalism, and I thought, how can we bring those herbs in to also further help you rebalance your hormones? So guess what? I came up with this idea for a new program called Herbs for Balance. And so we are working on the program. I'm actually in a production stages right now. We're going to be filming in the first week of May, a whole series of videos. And so what I wanted to ask you is, you know, we're going to be demoing and there's going to be over 120 different recipes on natural shampoos and naturally made skincare products you can make at home, lip glosses, um, you know, different pestos, lattes, tea infusions, uh, how to make your own deodorant that really works, that doesn't stain your shirt all over, you know, stuff like that. So I'm curious, um, I'm curious, what would you guys want to no, or here, uh, in terms of content, what kind of content would interest you the most in a program like that? What's, what's, what could be cool for you? Uh, what do you struggle with that you know is chemically not great for you, but because you don't have alternatives, then you, know, you kind of keep using it. So I'm curious to know, uh, Robin is saying she's making her own deodorant. Awesome, that's great. Um, what would you want to see something that you maybe tried making and it just didn't work? I feel like for me, it was about shampoos. And so I tried many online shampoos and I looked like a grease ball after that. Like one of them, I remember it was coconut milk and baking soda and, you know, a touch of um, Dr. Broner's soap, right? And, and then I, I just looked like a grease ball after that, right? It was terrible. So I wonder what do you, yeah, so thank you. So it's, it's coming in. Um, so awesome. So thank you for, for your post. Laundry detergents, shampoos. Okay. Uh, let's see what else are people saying here. I'm going to read out. To clean mold, Alex is saying. Okay, that's something to look into. Great. Replacing bleach. All right. To make my own deodorant. Yeah. Um, very nice, very nice. Nail polish, that's a hard one. Uh, can't teach that one. That's like, you need a chemical lab to do that. Body lotion, okay. So hey, you guys, so guess what I washed my hair with today? And I've been using it for the past three months and I'm loving it. I'm gonna share with you two things that I've been doing that really has been helping my hair. Um, and uh, I've never had great hair, you know, whether it's a genetic thing, I don't know, but I just never had great hair. Toothpaste, Andrea, yeah, we've got stuff for that. Apricot facial scrub, awesome. So what, guess what I washed my hair with, and I, just a little hint, it's a food <laughs> that's probably in your fridge. Um, so, so tell me, so let's see a toner with rose water. Okay, so, so I think people are still sharing about, uh, Sharni is saying coconut, no, I didn't wash it with coconut. If I wash my hair with coconut milk, with oil, obviously you can't wash it, but with milk, uh, it, I'll just look like a grease ball because I, I have greasy hair. Um, hair color, mm, that's a that's another a little tough one. So, any guesses? Do you guys want to guess? So while you are guessing with aloe, nope, uh, it was inside of vinegar, nope. <laughs> but it's a great conditioner though. It's a great rinse. Um, but I'll, while you guys are guessing and thinking about it, what did I wash my hair with this morning? That's in my fridge. I will give you another hint that I want to share with you, that I actually discovered from a friend of mine from India. And uh, Marie saying, honey, honey doesn't sit in a fridge, uh, but thank you. No, baking soda, that's close. I used to use baking soda, but I, what I had found is that I was getting split ends pretty quickly. Milk, mayo, wow, you guys are. <laughs> so it is close to mayo. It's close to mayo, but without the oils. I, I, that's like a dead giveaway, right? It's the, you're almost there, you're almost there. So come on, keep going. Eggs, Juliana is saying, yes, I washed my eggs, egg, hair with eggs, not the whites though, I separate out the, uh, I just use the yolk, so I use yolk for my hair, you guys, and I put oil in my hair yesterday because I tend to get split ends really easily, so I put a, a rosehip oil on my ends and it just got this beautiful, nice, bouncy 
uh, feel the next morning. And so my oil, my hair was greasy and I haven't washed it for a few days. And so I ended up just, and I washed it with, you can see it's really nice and shiny and, you know, and so, and I didn't even use any uh, rinses, like apple cider or nothing like that, right? Uh, so try it. So, you know, it's a really wonderful non-chemical option that does wonders. It really makes your hair look really feel healthy. Uh, it doesn't use any chemicals in it, which is awesome. It is an experience to get used to because when you first start, you know, you start off with by putting it on your scalp here, right? And then when you start, you know, when you start massaging it in and, and washing your hair, it's kind of like, it's not leathering, right? It's so it doesn't have that feel and you go, uh, is your hair thin? Linda is asking, is my hair is thin? Uh, does it smell bad? No, it just smells a little bit like this protein thing. But when, once you wash it out, it doesn't smell at all. Um, you can put some rose water in it as well, you know, just to dilute the egg yolks. And I have to tell you that, so that's the only weird thing about it. You kind of, you, you're doing this, you know, all around your hair and you kind of think like, is it really doing anything for me? Like, it still feels kind of greasy because egg yolks are pretty greasy, right? And I have to tell you, um, it just, it just does really wonders. And I use for my hair length, I use two eggs if my hair is not too greasy. If it's super greasy because I apply it, I don't know, some I was experimenting with stuff, then I'll do three egg yolks, but that's more than enough. Uh, Marie is saying to use cold water, otherwise cooked eggs, right? Yeah, so, <clears throat> you know, it's actually not true. Egg yolks really need super hot water to, uh, to, to set. So, no, actually I use warm water in my hair. I rinse it off with cold water. I started doing that. Um, but yeah, it's just make sure you don't have any egg whites in it. And sometimes it was very funny. I went out, um, I met up with a friend the other day and she looks at me, she's like, what's the white stuff in your hair here? And I had, you know, the little, the embryo thing or whatever is that little connector, right? That got cooked in a warm water, uh, water. And so it was in my hair. It's kind of funny. Uh, the other thing I want to tell you about that I've been using, which has been making more and more of a difference, is 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 from an Indian friend of mine. In India, women use fenugreek. You spell it F-E-N-U, Greek, G-R-E-E-K. Fenugreek in water. So you basically infuse two tablespoons of fenugreek in about six ounces of water, put in a hot water in a glass water, not plastic container. Let it infuse for about 12 to 40 to 24 hours until it becomes kind of like yellowish, like pea color, actually. And what you do is then after washing your hair, you basically um, put it into a bottle that has got like a shampoo bottle that's got a drizzle in it. You can drizzle it out and, and then, then just basically start putting that into your, your hair, um, massage it in, leave it out, right? And so it does have a little bit of a smell. I started using, adding clary sage oil to it which is a kind of a nice touch because clary sage is, helps to stimulate estrogen as well on a cellular level. So um, I suspect I had problems with hair loss because of estrogen issues in the past. So it was really nice to, you know, and I have to tell you, I don't know how much you can see this on the camera, but I have, I have a lot of baby hair uh, that's beginning to grow back much more than I had before. So I've been doing this for the past month and I really feel the difference. And uh, when I did some research on it, fair enough, it looks like women in India are using that on a regular basis um, to, to thicken their hair. And the other thing is that it is a natural hair thickener, so it makes you feel, I didn't put that in today, but when I do, it just feels like your hair, especially on the base level here, kind of like it gives you a volume, but again, without using any chemicals. Isn't that just awesome, that kind of stuff, just to be using that at home without any chemicals? And one of the things that when you transition out of using all these different, um, you know, all the chemical stuff, right? A few things is going to happen. You walk into like Walgreens or CVS and you're like, oh my God, I got a headache from all these chemicals. And then like when you go for a hike and you somebody walks past you, past you and you're like, oh, you're using this conditioner, that shampoo, this lotion, because you can just smell and that stuff on people. So... I, I find that it's like a real nice detoxification. You just realize how much chemicals we're actually constantly putting in on our bodies. So I'm wondering um, who here is gonna be trying that um, fenugreek, Terry's asking, is it a plant? No, it's a seed. Well, it's a plant, but it's, it's a seed that I'm talking about. And you can buy it in actually most health stores and um, Indian stores for sure, because it's an Indian spice. I think in the Middle East, they also use fenugreek. 
and it looks like um, it's like this little brown seed basically so yeah you can and you can always get it on Amazon right like what is it that you can't get on Amazon so uh, I read ground up oatmeal for dry shampoo yeah so we're gonna have a recipe in the book on sorry in the program on dry shampoo I don't need to use oatmeal uh, but we use other other things so here is gonna try these kind of shampoos I'm curious um, and it's saying I will try the egg shampoo tomorrow. Awesome. Great. So I'm gonna just, what questions do you guys have for me? Because I forgot that, um, I've been so excited about sharing other things with you guys. I wanted to check in with you and see what, what questions that are hormone related that you have for me that you would like me to talk about. We have another about five minutes before we wrap up this call. And, um, Charlene is saying she will try them. Great. I'm really glad. Um, and yeah, so Beverly is sharing a really interesting thing. She said, Beverly says, I've tried making my own shampoo several times and like you look too greasy. I work on a shampoo. Um, I work in a, shamp in a shop called Misty Mountain Soap uh, that makes hand soap lotions and now has shampoo conditioners I really love. No sulfates and parabens for the first time. Yeah, so one of the things that we're doing with the shampoos that I'm talking about is still not stripping really the oil from the hair uh, the way traditional, because for example, you can use Dr. Broner's soap, right? And still strip all the oils off your hair. The whole idea is to restore the pH of the, of the scalp so much so that you stop overproducing oil all the time because of constantly stripping it off so the body goes on a reverse and the more you strip, the more the body produces. Um, so the, the shampoos that I'm talking about that we're going to be teaching in my course are not stripping shampoos that are shampoos like the egg yolk, which is actually you're washing with an oil, but you're getting this kind of result. Uh, oh, Rachel is saying, uh, okay, let's do Jennifer first. Um, oh, there's a lot of questions coming in. So I don't, I would not, I'm just going to point you to a couple of places. So Jennifer is saying, I have low progesterone, any help? Yes, Jennifer. Um, Lisa uh, is my assistant who is listening. Lisa, could you post the link to our seed rotation article? So Jennifer, try the seed rotation. It really helps with boosting your progesterone levels. The other thing you can do is in your luteal phase, which is from the time of your ovulation to the time of your period, so second part of your cycle, um, get on um, evening primrose. It really helps to with doing that. Rachel is asking about hot flashes at night. Rachel, I did a whole call all the hot flashes, what to do. And so on one of the calls, I don't want to be repeating that information and it's like a 30 minute call. So go to hormonesbalance.com. That's my main website. And um, look under live Friday Q and A's and look for the hot flashes uh, video. It's right there. Um, let's see what else. Seed balancing, what to do and when I can't tolerate flax, exasperates my estrogen, Greg is, and Rachel Taylor are saying. Yeah, so I wonder whether, I, I guess it's Rachel who is talking here, right? Rachel, um, have you done my Cooking for Balance program or looked at the workshop? I would suggest do the free workshop first. It's called How to Use Food to Rebalance Hormones. It's an hour and a half, super intense, uh, very informative workshop. It's for free. Go to cookingforbalance.com. Lisa, if you could uh, post the link, that would be great, um, to the Cooking, Bal Cooking for Balance the, the workshop. And so, Rachel, I would suggest look at that because seed rotation is just one of the tools that you can use. There's a lot of other things you can do to rebalance your estrogen levels. Um, high estrogen, uh, Susan is saying, Susan Campbell is saying high estrogen because of a metabolic syndrome and how to fix it. Well, the first thing you need to do, Susan, it sounds like it, if you have a metabolic syndrome, is to reverse your working on your sugar levels, right? And so I'm wondering whether you've done anything in that paradigm, changing your diet, uh, changing your breakfast, big, big deal, getting rid of all the processed carbohydrates, right? Those are um, bringing in some good probiotics so that helps with estrogen metabolism because the gut really plays a huge role in estrogen metabolism. Um, again, I would suggest, um, Susan, take a look at the free workshop and, and, and learn something from there because this actually helps with a lot of other symptoms as well. I haven't had period in almost three years, 50 years old now, uh, Theresa. So, well, it sounds like um, menopause has just welcomed you. <laughs> All right, you guys, I'm going to wrap up today's call. I, um, 
I will see you next Friday, which is going to be a very busy Friday because it's going to be a Friday before we start shooting our videos. Thank you so much for your suggestions on what are the things that I can make. Um, and uh, we're going to bring that out in the videos. Actually, most of the things you guys have been asking for, except maybe for like, you know, um, I'm not going to like uh, nail polish is not something that we you can make in your own kitchen. We are looking at recipes that help you that you can just make in your own kitchen and, and with produce that are easily available out there. Okay, you guys, I'm going to chow off for today. Thank you so much for being with me today. I will see you next Friday. And before I chow off, actually, I don't have a topic yet for next, uh, for next Friday. So before you chow off from here, post something that you would want me to talk about. If I haven't talked about it yet, I will cover that. All right? Cool, you guys. I will see you next Friday and talk about whatever you want me to talk about. Bye for now.